Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to session 27 of Principles of Management course. Dear students, I am your instructor Dr. Shikha N. Khera from Delhi School of Management, Delhi Technological University. We have been discussing on various management functions. Today we will talk about controlling as the last function of or managerial function of management. Now what is a prerequisite on the part of a manager? Prerequisite is to get the work done, to achieve the goals and the tasks which have been planned and decided and thus through the required behavior on the part of the employees. So it is essential on the part of manager to control the behavior of employees in the right manner or in right direction. So what is fundamentally controlling? Controlling is that we have to see whether we are doing or moving ahead as per the standards which have been performed. So if this is the standard and where performance is meeting it, so that means we are in the controlled manner working but if the performance goes above the standard so that means we are again the process or the control and behavior of employees is in the right direction rather it is above it but the concern arises when this standard meeting is the actual performance is below the standards which we have set so this is the gap which needs to be identified and this gap can be in very many different arenas also so it is important to know what are the sub concepts of controlling so as to understand this concept better so let us try to find out what controlling has in it inherited in for us so through controlling managers ensure that things go on in the way they have Planned and they try to control the behavior of individuals. It also involves taking necessary actions if there are any deviations from the plans as I mentioned. So thus controlling enables what? Controlling enables the manager to modify and redefine the goals and plans to suit the new developments and the circumstances which are around the organization. Let us see few formal definitions of control by renowned authors and researchers. So management control is the process by which managers influence other members of organization to implement organizational strategies. Control is any process that helps align the actions of individuals with the interest of their employing firm. So basically what we are doing, we are aligning the actions of individuals, we are influencing the other members of the organization. So what are the characteristics of control process or controlling concept? The first characteristic is that it is a goal oriented activity. Why is it a goal oriented activity? Because we have some set objectives and these set objectives have to be met. It is a generic process because it has generic stages of the process. Process means that there are stages and steps. So it has generic stages. What are those generic stages? Like you set the standard first and after setting the standard, you execute the work and after executing, you measure the performance and then you see the deviation. So thus it is called as a generic process. It is a dynamic and continuous activity because it adjusts the goals as per the requirements. What are the adjustment of goals as per requirement? Because of change in some external or internal environment of business. It is an all pervasive activity. All pervasive action means that it runs through the whole organization. When any activity runs through the organization at every level, running through the organization means that it is at every level. So it is called as all pervasive activity. It is a probabilistic technique because here you have only looked to increase the possibility of achieving the targets. 
you cannot be 100% sure of that your target will be achieved but you ensure through control that targets are met. It is closely related to planning because here objectives are set and goals are also set which is also one of the features of planning where objectives and goals are set. So after knowing the characteristics of control process or controlling phenomena or fundamental, let us move ahead to understand importance of control. Controlling enables the managers to know whether the organizational members are working towards the predetermined goals and objectives or not. This helps in identifying the deviation. Control is an important activity which ensures that organizational activities are properly carried out and short and long term goals are attained in a time bound manner. So here we can find out whether they are working towards predetermined goals in timely manner or not. It ensures the effective and optimum utilization of resources. It enables organization to maintain efficient and accountable workforce and it is capable of increasing productivity and reducing costs. So this is the importance of having control system in the organization. It further enables the manager to detect the employees underperformance also, which is much needed because if employee is underperforming, the productivity will definitely be hampered. The wastage of resources is also catered and looked after by the control process and suitable corrective actions in order to improve the employee performance and reduce the wastage resource is to be taken, which control helps in identifying. Controlling further focuses on managing effectively the imposed work discipline. This work discipline is essentially very important. It also enables to cope up with the organizational complexities and effectively. Controlling felicitates the impersonal supervision of employee performance. Now this term impersonal is very important so that there is no subjective bias. That is no nepotism and favoritism is done. Controlling also uh, supervision of employee performance by setting communication and communicating the predetermined standards in advance. Then further controlling has importance like it enables the manager to protect organizational resources from the da da dangers of financial scandals, security breaches, workplace violence, etc. It encourages managers to introduce employee empowerment. Empowerment means employee has a say to speak and share ideas. He is empowered to take a little bit, bit of decision making also. So not much but a bit of decision making based on his work profile. This also is the part of controlling. Now let us see what are the steps in the control process. Steps in control process are presented in this figure which there are four steps in control process. The first one is establishing standards of performance, second measuring the actual performance, third comparing the, comparing the actual performance against the standards and then deciding the needs for corrective action if required. Let us see these steps. Establishing standards of performance for instance the Food and Safety Standard Authority of India sets the standards for articles of food under the Food and Safety Standard Act 2006. So the entire control process begins with establishing of performance standards against the actual organizational and individual performances then compared later on. Second step is measuring the actual performance. So the daily, weekly and monthly reports on sales figures measure sales performance. Similarly, product quality, production volumes and unit cost measures production performance. However, some control criteria like employee absenteeism, turnover, employee satisfaction can be used to measure any management situation as people management is the responsibility of all managers. So once the performance standards are established, you first have to establish the performance standard. In the previous step we did this, then we have to communicate that and find out the measurement of these established standards. So in this regard, managers need relevant information to determine what is the actual performance and managers tend to use one or more of 
different approaches to find out what is the actual performance and how we find out the actual performance with the help of either personal observation statistical reports oral reports and written reports with the help of these they get the actual performance data then the step 3 is talking about comparing the actual performance against the standard so at this stage the controlling process actual performance is evaluated with the help of the standard set earlier this is done by comparing the actual performance with standards with the aim of knowing the performance variations so here actual performance may be more than that is a positive variation or less than that is a negative variation or can be equal to the standard which i mentioned in the beginning of the session so normally managers will find it easy to make comparison if the standards are clear and the actual performance are easy to measure so these are the two prerequisites that we need to have in order to have right kind of comparison between the standard performance and the actual performance next step that is step 4 is deciding the need for corrective action do we need to go ahead with corrective action or not so based on the results of comparison managers will determine the need for corrective actions and there is a simple equation to use which is useful for better understanding of need for action do we want to go for action or not so this simple equation says need for action is equal to the desired performance minus the actual performance this the manager has to follow and for this the manager normally chooses to act in any one of the following three ways after they complete the performance evaluation so first is maintaining the status quo this is called the do nothing option managers normally prefer to maintain the status quo that is wherever they are they want to remain there when actual performance is equal to the standards of the deviation within the acceptable limit it will be useful to provide positive feedback including rewards to the people who are responsible for those actions so that they can they are encouraged to continue to meet the performance standards so this is the first scenario where we have equal standard we can give reward to the employee second is correcting the actual performance so that means there is some deviation so this is called a problem situation where actual performance is less than the standards and it is it calls for some definite corrective action the general purpose of any corrective action is a problem in a problem situation is to promote the actual performance this is how you can bring in change because that means the deviation is actual standard was here and the performance was here there is a gap in between so we have to promote the actual performance to reach it up to the standard so corrective actions which normally require certain changes in some behaviors or some actions or other aspects of the organization they take actual performance closer or equal to the standards so we have to then focus on what actions and behaviors need to be done to improve the performance for example they may provide training initiate Uh, initiate disciplinary actions or decrease money monetary benefit if satis if unsatisfactory work is found to be reasons for performance variation so these are the various methodologies the manager will opt for in order to improve the performance of the employee and this is done after careful analysis of problems behind the performance deviation managers could take different corrective action so these are the different corrective actions so in any case managers must first decide whether the situation requires immediate corrective action or basic corrective action so that needs to be found out we can divide them into immediate and basic corrective actions and if the performance problem is to be attended immediately to achieve desired performance levels the managers may pre prefer immediate corrective actions as against that if the manager wants to know the root cause of problem variations in detail then he will go for basic corrective 
action. The third stage is changing the standards. So, this can be done all together if we feel that standards are difficult to be met or they are too easy to be achieved. So, actual performance in some instances variations may occur due to improper standards like unrealistically either too high or too easy or too low. So, the actual performance may consistently exceed the standards when they are too low to achieve. So, in such a situation managers should upwardly revise the standards. We have to revise the standard based on whether it is too easy or too high. In contrast managers may have to lower the standards when the different performance consistently fail to meet the standards. Now, here there is a note of caution that there is a tendency among people to blame the standards for their own failures. So, this is a disclaimer here we have to see to it that whether it is because people are not able to achieve it that is why they are uh, blaming it or whether the standards itself are too high to be or they are very unachievable. So, for example, sales people may blame their sales targets when they fail to achieve them. So, in any case the performance standards should not be either too rigid and always reflect the realities of prevailing situations. This was the process of controlling in the organization various step by step things then approaches to control approaches to management control system in the organization. Approaches means that how or what are the styles ways and means by which the organization goes for controlling all the processes. So, they are classified these approaches are classified into six categories and understanding of these approaches will enable the managers to design management control system very effectively. Let us see what are these approaches. Approaches to management control include first bureaucratic or mechanic approach, agency approach, human resource approach, cybernetic approach, contingency approach and cultural approach. Let us discuss these approaches in detail. So, bureaucratic and mechanic approach according to this approach control is a discrete function of the management. Organizations adopt formal policies, practices and procedures to standardize and influence behavior, evaluate performance and correct the undesirable deviations from the standards. Objectives, rules, hierarchy of authority, reward system, standardization are few examples or uh, are few bureaucratic and mechanic instruments used to implement the control systems. Employee compliance is the most important thing in the bureaucratic approach. Compliance to rules is extremely important in bureaucratic and mechanic approach. After bureaucratic and mechanic approach, the second approach is cybernetic approach. Now, according to cybernetic approach, activities related to control process are actually information based activities. Why we say information based activities? Because we get information on how the performance has been done. So, what happens then? A feedback loop. is a section of control system that allows for self correction wherever there are differences between the actual output and the standard output. So, as per this approach any corrective action in case of any performance variation will happen as a dynamic process based on feedback loops. So, feedback loop which is feedback about the performance level helps to auto correct the things. 
So they are to be seen from an information processing perspective. The basic premise is that a system self-regulatory abil ability to base on feedback loop. He the system regulates itself after receiving the feedback. Goal setting, budgeting, resource allocation, performance measurement, identification of deviations and corrective actions and reward allocation are, on, are all information based activities which are followed here in the approach. The third approach to controlling is agency approach that is you can also control by having an agency relationship. So, here according to this approach each organization is a unit in which there are two parties one party is principal and the other party is an agent and they have this primary relationship so the two important agencies seen in organization are the principal example here is top management and agent is the relationship between uh, sorry the two important agency relationships seen in the organization are shareholder shareholders who are the principal and top management who is the agent here so another relationship is top management becomes the principal and subordinates become the agent so students you can see here that agents are changing and the principals are also changing depending on the relationship so as per this view organization should strive hard to reach commonality of interest between principals and agents resulting in minimized agency cost. Then comes human resource approach. This is because both the organization and employee benefits out of such good fit. What is the good fit we are talking about? According to this approach, it is basically necessary to find a good fit between the organizational members. For example, organization benefits by getting committed people with creativity and motivation. Individual gets benefit by getting meaningful and enjoyable rewards. So this is a good fit between employee and the employer. Employee is getting what he wants, employer is getting what he wants. So in this approach, organizations are primarily viewed as correlation of decision making individuals. So, it is therefore necessary to identify and understand and recognize the differences in capacity and capabilities of these individuals. Then next approach is contingency approach. So, according to this approach organizations are open systems that should constantly adopt to changes in the internal and external environment. Changes because of change in the situation that takes place. So, this approach presupposes that there can be no fit all control system available that suits all the organization in all situations because situation is a critical factor which keeps on changing and because of change in situation we cannot adopt a specific system to control. So this is because the efficacy of a system that is an organization is affected by variety of contingent factors. So generally what are the contingent factors? It can be the size of the organization, scale in which it is working, technology that is adopted by the organization, it can be leadership, style or the culture of the organization. Since there are very many contingent factors, thus there cannot be a specific control system which can fit for all situations. Then next comes the cultural approach. The cultural approach usually values norms, traditions, perceptions, beliefs collectively shape the culture of the organization. According to this approach, each organization has certain culture that helps the members to interpret organizational activities. So if you are having birthday celebrations or having some recreational activity, so that is the culture of organization that every member can interpret. You can have different events, you can have different policies. All these things make organization culture different for one organization to the other. So as per this approach, cultural factors have significant influence on the control practices of the organization. Hence, management must understand how organization members, they understand these factors, they define these factors or modify these factors. After the discussion on the cultural approach, let us move on to different types of control. 
So the, as I mentioned, there are different types of control. There is no usually accepted control system available for the organization that we have discussed earlier. So generally the nature of organization intended users and the characteristic of problem they influence the manager decisions regarding to the choice of control methods and system in the organization. That can be divided into two categories, internal control which refers to people exercising self control in their work. What is the self control in their work? So make, to make the internal control effective, managers must ensure that employees are well aware of organizational goals. Also employees should be provided with adequate resources and they should be committed and high caliber workforce. This helps to have good internal control in the organization. Then coming on to external control, external control refers to the imposition of control on work activities of the organization members through external rewards and direct supervision. So generally external control takes place when organization members are controlled by managers through various administrative administrative systems. In external control also the you know the student you know students in external control the situation within which employees does his or her work is clearly structured to make certain goals to be fulfilled. So external controls can ensure that members perform their work well because they are aware that their good performance will be rewarded. To make external control more effective, managers must ensure that objectives and performance standards are relatively difficult. There is no scope available to the members to manipulate the performance measures and the members know about direct link between performance and the rewards. Thus, they have high morale to complete the job. Now let us see different types of management control which are there in organizations. So types of management control includes first operational control, financial control, structural control, strategic control and informational control. Let us start first with the operational control. In operational control there are three terms which are written here feed forward control, concurrent control and feedback control. Now operational control deals with processes adopted by an organization for conversion of resources from products into services and it has different phases of cycle. It mostly operates in open system that is it has external environment connection and there are three types of control that deal with different phases of input and output cycle. I shall be explaining these three with the help of this graphic. So student what are the three steps in the operational control? The first step is called as feed forward control. Feed forward control means that we are controlling the process before occurring of any event which is of non-compliance or we can say any error before it occurs we control it. We call it as feed forward control. Second phase is concurrent control. So in feed forward control we have put in the input. In concurrent control the process is going on. Process of conversion of input into output. During this concurrent control this is we control the error while the process is on or while the error is taking place. We are controlling it. The third phase is feedback control. Now the output has been generated but even if the output has been generated we can still take some corrective measures and as a result we can remove the error. So these are the three stages. Let us see these stages in this graphic which talks about work inputs, work throughputs and work outputs. Work input is feed forward control which ensures the right directions are set and right resources and inputs are available and it solves the problem before they occur. While concurrent control it ensures the right things are being done as part of workflow operations. 
wherein we solve the problems while they are occurring in during the concurrent control and work output is feedback control ensures that final results are up to the desired standards it solves the problems after they have occurred so this is about the first part that is the operational control we have discussed this by now let us move on to the second type of management control which is called as financial control so financial control can be dealt with with the help of financial statements ratio analysis budget and financial audit let's take them one by one financial control deals with the financial resources of the organization so the primary purpose of this financial control is to check whether the financial resources are optimally utilized or not so financial statements budgets and financial aud audits are the key roles that they play in financial control and we shall be discussing them here so financial statements are summarized of monetary data of an organization and financial statements typically include balance sheets and the income statement so what is balance sheet balance sheet shows the financial position of the organization at a particular point of time say 31st march of any year by listing its assets and liabilities of the organization income statement indicates the results of the organization business operations which may show profit revenue more than expenses or loss that is expenses more than the revenue during the year so financial statements can provide a wealth of information to the external parties like shareholders creditors who are the external party shareholders creditors who lend us the loan government authorities or can be tax authorities also so all these help all these people get help to know about the wealth of the in information about wealth of the organization or you can talk about that financial health of the organization can be known with the help of financial statements and income statements and balance sheets so here by they by the limited but they have the managers have limited use to Uh, of these uh, statements this is because financial statements mostly deal with the past period of the organization so managers therefore prepare ratio analysis and cash flow statements based on this financial data so as to have some control over the financial resources cash flow statements enable managers to find out the resources of cash inflows and transaction that result in ca cash outflows during a specific period say accounting year so how much cash has come in and how much has gone out ratio analysis in turns offers multiple benefits to managers so let us see how ratio analysis helps financial controlling activities ratios are useful to managers in assessing the financial health of an organization ratio analysis involves comparison of any two related financial data for giving a meaningful inference so the rationale behind the preparation of ratio analysis is that a single figure say a profit of rupees 5 million by itself has little meaning if we say that we earned rupees 5 million does it have any meaning no so by itself has little meaning unless it is compared with another relevant figure say a capital of rupees 50 million so now it can be ascertained that the business made a 10% return that is profit on its investment so which will be with the help of this formula we can calculate depending on the information requirements manager can work out different ratios so let us see what are different ratios the first one is liquidity ratio the frequently used ratio one of the frequently used ratio is liquidity ratio 
these are useful to determine the ability of an organization to meet its short term financial obligations. It also indicates the organization's short term financial strength or solvency. So, this ratio actually tells one, one's ability to pay off its debts. So, when they become due. So, in other words what we can say this ratio tells how quickly a company can convert its current assets into cash so that it can pay off its liability on a timely basis. So, example of liquidity ratio are current ratio, liquid or quick ratio and absolute liquid ratio. These are helpful different activity ratios are there. So, these are helpful to managers in measuring how effectively the organization uses its resources. So, effectiveness in using its resources is judged through activity ratio. As students activity ratios are financial matrix which used you which are used to gauge how efficient companies operations are generating revenue from its assets. So, we have resources in organization how well are we utilizing those resources. So, thus we say that activity ratio measures the efficiency of the business. So, which is basically measured. It evaluates the performance of certain key activities of organization like inventories, accounts receivable, accounts payable, fixed asset etc. The examples are inventory turnover ratio, receivable turnover ratio and payable turnover ratios. Then we have leverage and capital structure ratio. These ratios establish relationship between owners capital and borrowers fund. So, it shows what percent what part or portion of assets of a company is being financed by investors and how much leveraged a company is using by using this debt. So, these are useful in assessing long term financial strength of the organization. So, that means a higher equity ratio shows the potential investors that existing investors have trust in the company and are willing to invest for further also. We have people who rely on us and will give us loan later on as well. They help in measuring organizations ability to pay interest regularly and the principal on due date. So, this is a strength of the company. Examples are debt equity ratio, debt asset ratio and equity asset ratios. Moving further we have also profitability ratio. These are type of accounting ratios that help in determining the financial performance of business at the end of an accounting period. So, profitability ratio actually shows how well a company is able to make the profit from its operations. So, operating efficiency is the most key term in profitability ratio. It enables the manager to understand the financial soundness of the organization based on how well is his its efficiency in operations. Example for profitability ratio are gross profit ratio, net profit ratio, expense ratio, return on asset etc. etc. and return of capital as well. So, here we have discussed the second kind of category of control system. The third financial control system is budgets. Budgets are important financial tools used by managers for controlling work activities at almost all levels of the organization. So, budgets are generally prepared for a specific period of time. And budgets may offer information on estimated revenues, expenses connected with functions like marketing, production, etc. And it may also indicate that which work activities are important out of these for the organization, out of these activities, which activities are catering more to the organizational functioning. 
Now, characteristic of a budget statement is that they are formulated before commencement of work. They serve as standards. They are the basis for coordinating the different activities of the organization. Budget feedback can serve as inputs for improving both planning and controlling processes. They are often viewed as costly and time consuming exercise and also seen as obstacles that can limit the imagination of innovation of people. So they are the limitations of the budget that based on this constraint, their creativity is disturbed. It is costly and time consuming also, but they serve as standards and they coordinate different activities. Budgets can further be classified into broadly two categories. So we have operating budgets and we have financial budgets. Operating budgets deal with physical activities of organization while example for this operating budget can be purchase budget, production budget, sales budget etc. While the financial budget deals with the cash receipt, payments, business results and what are the examples of financial budgets? Cash budget, budgeted income statement etc. So this is how budgets are classified into two categories. Now the next financial control system is financial audit. An audit is an independent examination and expression of opinion. It is an opinion by the auditor on the financial statement of enterprise by this appointed person who is called as an auditor. So it basically involves independent verification. This person will go for independent verification of organizational, financial, operational and accounting practices. So basically audits are of two types which are done by the auditors. They are compliance audit and operational audit. Compliance audits confirm the fairness of information against the given standard. So whether we have complied or not with the standard which we had made. Operational uh, audits evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of any work activity in the organization or any work activity or function in the organization. With this we have covered the financial control as well. We discussed financial statements, ratios, budget and financial audit. Now we may move on to the third control system which is the structural control. Structural control is done with the help of four different structural parameters. So structural control focuses on effectiveness of organization structural variables or the elements, the four elements that we saw just now. They are centralization, formalization, output control and culture control. Management may use any one of the four structural control mechanisms for achieving organizational goals and purposes. So these are four mechanisms. We have already discussed centralization during the organizing part that the decision making is central, commanded by the corporate office. Formalization is having rules and regulations in place, formal standards or norms in place to carry out the work. Output control talks about that what are the standards that we have kept. So manager may control the decision making process by establishing those goals and objectives and they become our output control parameters. Cultural control is organization culture has some systems, beliefs and values. So these system beliefs and values become the measuring factor for the performance or you can say behavior of the employees in the 
organization. So with the help of these four control mechanism parameters, the structural control takes place in organization. So after structural control discussion, we now move on to the next control system which is structure strategic control. So in strategic control, strategic control actually attempts to basically identify how effective is an organization. in its corporate business and functional strategy. So what do we mean by being effective? Being, being effective here means that they are able to meet up to the kind of strategic move they have made, they are getting the returns also. So this control actually students attempt to make sure that organizations keep effective alignment of their environment and facilitates the achievement of their strategic goal. Here who is responsible, top manager is responsible for the strategic control to gain operational understanding of the organization's various operating units. Strategic control involves effective and continuous control of leadership, technology, human resources, information structure and operational system. So at a as a part of strategic control for example, students and organization may analyze whether the existing structure or leadership style is improving the performance or is declining the performance in decision making. Thus they can make in change in any of the policies that they have made. After strategic control, we have the last control that we have to study under types of control. This one is the information control system. So information control has become a necessity for the organizations. Managers need the right information at the right time for making the right decisions about people and physical resources. So they also need adequate information for supervising and evaluating the organizational activities. So managers use information control to achieve control over all the organizational activities. However, they should not be fed with too much of information. Or too little of information. So, what is solicited here is generally the managers use information control to achieve control over all organizational activities. Now there is a growing need to tighten the information control mechanism due to frequent information theft. So this is another fundamental which is happening in today's time, information theft caused by, can you guess students, information theft is done due to internal or external security breaches. This is how we get lots and lots of frauds also. So managers often rely on computer based management information system to get necessary information in a timely and need based manner. MIS is capable of gathering data and converting them into appropriate useful information for the managers. Here we have concluded the types of control system. Now let us try to see the characteristics of effective control. As we all know control is an inherent part of any organization and the success and planning of uh, success of all planning initiatives and goal accomplishment of organization depends on effectiveness of the control mechanism. However, students the characteristic of con effective control may vary with situation and also from one form of one organization to the other. So what we need to have is that the control system needs to be easily understandable. What do we mean by easily understandable? Generally the control mechanism remains simple, straightforward and less complicated at the lower level of the management. So when the control system is not properly understood by the people 
who are affected by it it would cause necessary anxiety and frustration in the members and because of this anxiety and frustration they, they may not showcase their best of abilities then comes the flexible control system so the control mechanism must be sufficiently flexible to give a space for some kind of change which is required for instance students when a change in product line needs corresponding change in raw material requirement then control system must be flexible enough to handle the increase or decrease in the material requirements after flexibility then comes the suitability of the control system so it must be a mechanism which should be suitable for activities to be carried out a complexity of activities should determine the complexity of control process so a small task performed in small department may not require an intensive or comprehensive control system so suitability of control system should be made as per the task which is to be performed then the control system must have a characteristic of being accurate so accuracy is which should be uh, accurate in terms of generating right information from which the control mechanism has to work because if we come up with inaccurate information it will lead to inaccurate decision making affecting the interest of the organization after this we move on to the timeliness of the control system because if you do not perform that control system within the given timeline it is of no use so control mechanism should be capable of detecting the performance variables without any delay no delay in identifying the gap in the performance managers must be informed of such variance at the earliest so that their corrective actions can be quickly taken control should also be linked to the plans and the goals so generally goals set a part of planning process which eventually help in the controlling system so therefore there must be a clear and explicit link between planning and control so managers can do an excellent job of linking planning function with controlling function but by simultaneously working on goal formulation and setting the standards and the last parameter to have effective control is principle of exceptions so here the control system must be designed in such a way that only significant variations that require some kind of corrective actions are brought to the notice of the manager so that we do not waste unnecessary time in the redundant activities managers must not be troubled as long as everything is comfortably as per the standards so these are different characteristics of effective control system tomorrow when you become managers in organizations you need to see that how you can have the control system in place with the help of these parameters that we have discussed now we move on to reasons for resistance to control in the organizations first let us define what is resistance to control resistance to control student means that if some kind of control system is being implemented that can be their behavioral control system or that can be control system with respect to their tasks in both the cases employees generally feel that they have been deviated from their status quo they do not like getting away from their status quo they have been into that process into that way of working from various weeks months or years so any change with the help of change in the control system will not be liked by the organizational members so what will they do they will retaliate they will revolt and this retaliate and revolt will become the resistance towards any control system which is taking place it can be a control system uh, about punctuality of time for attending the office it can be control system for punctuality of delivering the task etc so reasons for resistance to control in the organization can be characterized as first the excessive control exercising too much of control over the employee behavior can certainly be harmful as they may feel stressed out and excessive control may make employees operate more out of fear than out of willingness to contribute so this control mechanism is essential for seeing it that if we go for excessive control that will lead to a kind of frustration in the 
employees and they will then of course will go for resistance towards that control. Moving further, we may have perceived bias. So, when employees think that control mechanism lacks objectivity in the fixation of standards, measures and rewards, they are likely to resist such control measures. So, they may feel lacking objectivity means that there is some kind of favoritism or nepotism going on and because of which they may have a preconceived notion about it. So, similarly, when employees feel that rewards are grossly insufficient for their performance, they may resist the control initiatives because they feel that we are not being given for what we what we actually deserve, then why are we being controlled by the organization. Tendency to avoid accountability, that is also one of the reasons because of which employees try to avoid the control system. So, control requires employees to accept responsibility for their work activities. In reality, employees often mistakenly associate accountability which is a basic responsibility or answerability of a worker with discipline. Employees feel that if I am accountable to my boss, this is a kind of punishment to given to me. So, the resistance can be more severe if the managers are not making sure that employees understand the goals and expectations which is basically the accountability towards their job and that clarity in, clarity in understanding should be given to the employees. Next is absence of employees participation in the control process. So, when employees are not involved in controlling process, they are not made part of how the control system or mechanism will work, they may feel alienate, alienated from it and they may also think that all control measures are externally imposed on them. This imposition will make them feel that they are being controlled and thus they may not like such control system. In such a situation, they may resist managers effort to set up a control system in the organization. Coming on to inconsistent focus, so when there are inbuilt contradictions in the goals, purposes of focus of controlling functions, employee may oppose control if such contradiction will have any negative effect on the organization or the individual. For instance, sales target that forces sales people to pursue high pressure tactics to achieve short term sales target may produce a negative impact on public image of organization in the long run. So, this has to be avoided. So, these were many reasons because of which students employees go for resistance towards the change. Now, what at this stage is expected is that resistance towards the change uh, towards the control needs to be overcome and the strategies to overcome that resistance to control includes application of MBO technique, gaining the confidence of employees through transparent process and multiple verification processes. We have already understood all these parameters beforehand also so that people have better understanding of their control processes. So, what are these strategies students when we talk about application of MBO techniques we are talking about having standards which are set in consultation with the employees. When standards are set in consultation with the employees they also feel comfortable and they accept such control system that they will be they will be uh, seen to it whether they are meeting those standards or not. So, MBO which was a step by step breakdown of broader objectives into smaller objectives in consultation with the employees proves to be one of the good strategies to overcome the resistance towards the change. Second is gaining the confidence, confidence of the employee through the transparent process. Now, if we give clear process of performance appraisal, clear process of uh, working in the organization, it will go towards enhancing employees acceptability towards any control mechanism. And the last one is multiple verification process. Multiple verification process means that they should have multiple ways by which even employee can also verify the control mechanism and employer can also see to it. The employee also has a feeling that I am not being cheated by my employer. These are the ways and means because which are very much required by the organization to control the performance. So, thus these multiple ways will enable the employee to have a satisfaction with respect to the control system which is being practiced in the organization. 
So students we have discussed about the controlling process in today's session and this is the bibliography which I have referred to for this particular course which you may also see if you wish to. With the help of this uh, content on controlling process I am sure that you people have understood what are the various different sub concepts of controlling. So this is all from my side for this session and I thank you all for listening to me patiently.